When I was in, oh, sixth, seventh grade, I was out playing tag with some of the boys at recess. Right as the bell rang to go in, one of the boys tagged me. And as happens in school, there was an argument about whether it was before the bell, during the bell, or after the bell that the actual touch occurred. I said that it was after the bell. He said it was before the bell. <clears throat> Well, we went in, and the thing about the boy who touched me was he happened to be the most popular kid in the class. I was not the most popular kid in the class, but it became more and more difficult for me to hang out with the popular kids. And at one point, I remember I, I kept trying to be friends with them, kept trying, to, but something was against me, or someone was against me. And then one day I went out, and they all lined up in a row, and they said, we hate you. And I sort of smiled and turned around, and I walked back in the building. And it's interesting what shame feels like, what rejection feels like. This sort of warm feeling that comes up through you and you just, it sort of sticks to you, overshadows you. You don't you really know what to do with it. Well, at that age, I didn't know what to do with it. Just sort of shrugged it off or... And I just, I just want to pause for a moment to, to have you think. Whenever there's shame, especially if it's for something that you did, whether imagined or real, what do you do with that? How do you process it? How do you get rid of it? Because it's, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming for a sixth grader. It's overwhelming for... Some 70 years old. Shame is a very powerful emotion. Now we use it, in fact, it's necessary in our socialization process. Shame is the reason that none of us are sitting there with our fingers in our noses. Or There's something about shame that tells you that's not what we do in public. If you do that, people will not want to be with you. So there is there is a use for shame. It can be very useful to help you understand what is or isn't socially acceptable. But it's useful for about a minute. And if you're a parent and you want to use shame, you can let your children know that what they're doing is not acceptable. But if you let them sit in shame, if you let shame sort of cover them, what happens is they start believing that something is wrong with me. It's not just my behavior, it's actually me. And many of us, perhaps even most of us, had parents or siblings or teachers or groups of friends who would shame us and let us sit in that and then if you wanted to be in the group, you had to obey exactly what I said. Well, not long after that, I guess maybe six months, I had to find some new friends. So there was a boy in the class. He was new. His name, I'll call him Bill. And he was, well, he was from a foster home. He did, his real parents did not live in the town. And so I began talking with him, and he invited me over to the house, over to his house, one day after school. And so I went over, and as we walked around Bill's neighborhood, 
I noticed there was a church in the neighborhood. And this church, I knew, was the church that, it, that was attended by several of the boys, including the most popular boy who had rejected me. They went to this church. Well, I wanted to get a good look at the church, so we walked all the way around it, looked at the stained glass windows, and I noticed there were no cars in the parking lot. And this thought came over me, you know, I think I know a way to get back at these boys. I think if we throw some rocks through the windows of this church, that it's going to punish those boys. So I talked to Bill, and Bill was, well, it wasn't his idea, but I, I said, Bill, I know what we should do. I think we should see if we can throw rocks through the windows of this church. Well, Bill actually was pretty good at throwing rocks. He got through first. In fact, I had to move up quite close for me to get through the window. But we both threw him through the window and, and uh, walked away. I was feeling pretty good about myself. I thought this. This really solved that problem. This really got back at those boys. <laughs> well, about a week later, I was in bed. My mother came in and she says, you know, a funny thing happened today. Bill's mother called and she said that Bill was saying something about throwing rocks through the church windows. And he's in trouble for that. Do you know anything about it? I don't know anything about that. No, I don't know what he's talking about. Went off to sleep. But I, I remember a bit of terror came over me. It's one thing to be rejected by a group of boys. That's humiliating enough. But to be caught throwing windows, throwing rocks through the windows of their church. That's a whole nother level of humiliation. So I had to deny it, or so I thought. Well, I never actually saw Bill again that I remember. I don't remember ever seeing him again. I believe what happened now in retrospect is that he was a foster child in this neighborhood, and someone, I don't know how, how, who would have seen us, because I was pretty sure no one was watching, but somehow Bill was identified with this crime, and he was transferred to another foster situation. I want to talk about how we get these ideas and what we do with these ideas and then how do we clean it up. Because I don't have any idea of what happened to Bill or where Bill is today. I'll tell you that a few years ago I did contact that church and sent them some money to replace <laughs> windows in that church. <laughs> but it is interesting how easy it was for me to let Bill take the fall for that. And I want to go to a passage that's familiar to most of you. It is the parable of the two sons, the prodigal son. Most of you have heard this story, many of you know this very well, but what I want you to do anytime we read a passage of scripture is, I want you to look this time for something new. Jesus is a master storyteller. He is a genius. He is the smartest man who has ever lived. And he is telling us a story here that has many, many levels. So if you pick this up on one level, whether you've gone to Bible school or whether you've read this a hundred times, I want you to listen for a new level. Maybe there's a character in this story you haven't 
really thought of. You've only thought of it from one character or another. Let's, let's look at all the characters. Luke 15, I'll start in uh, <clears throat> verse 11. But before, let me read verse 1. Because we want to know why Jesus is telling this story. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So he's talking to the Pharisees, the religious elite. And the religious elite are upset with Jesus because he's not talking to the poor and the sinners and the tax collectors and people who've done illegal things. He's not only talking to them, he's receiving them into his home and he's eating with them. And this is really irritating because in that culture, as often in ours, it's fine to give money to the poor. It's fine to do a nice thing for someone who's down and out. But if you receive them and eat with them, what might people think of you? They might think that you're associated with them, that you have some bad character, you're, you're in cahoots with them. So Jesus is basically saying to them, and he's going to tell these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son. And he's going to tell these three, and basically he's going to say, Gentlemen, you are upset with me for eating with sinners. I'm here to tell you it's much worse than you think. I not only eat with them, I run to them. I throw my arms around them. I give them the best robe and I kill the fatted calf and throw a party for them. It's far worse than you think. <laughs> There's something about Jesus that's so disruptive. It's so disruptive. And it disrupts us at all angles and at all levels. Verse 11, and he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property among them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. <coughs> and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So he would have, the father, would have had to divide his property among two sons. The older son gets a double portion. He would have gotten two-thirds. This younger son would have gotten one-third of his property. Now, property is family property. For the son to leave, he had to sell it, cash it out, turn it into cash, and leave with it. So that property is gone. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise. And go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. 
and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I want you to just pause for a moment. And I want you to think of whether or not the younger son wanted the party. Did this prodigal son want the father to throw a party for him? No. Why not? What was he feeling? Shame. So the father takes him, walks through town with him with the best robe on him, protecting him actually from the townspeople. There is a tradition in that in those days that th when someone did this kind of disgraceful thing, you threw rocks at them when they came back. So what is the father doing? That's why he runs to him. It's very disgraceful for a, a man in that culture to run. Because you have to pick up, they wore sort of those long ropes, you have to pick them up, show your legs, and run down the street. Very disgraceful in that culture. But this father, to protect his son from what's coming from the townspeople, runs to him. Makes him feel welcome. Throws his arms around him. Kisses him. Not just covers him with a robe. The best robe. By the way, the best robe was the father's robe. Puts his own robe on him. And with him, he walks him through the town to protect him from spitting and rock throwing and all of the things that would be coming, all the shame that would be coming from the townspeople who know that what this son has done is basically said, Dad, I don't want to wait for you to die to get your inheritance. It's fine with me if you were dead right now. Just give me the money. Incredibly disgraceful thing this son has done. So if we're talking about mistakes that we've made, we're talking about a very, very large mistake here. But the father, which amazes me, at how many offenses this, fa offenses this father takes, and he's not mentioning any of them. He's not even mentioning, is all the money gone? Did you, did you spend it all? A third of my property. If your son spent a third of your property, I mean, that, that's a loss you would be feeling. You have a third less of this family heirloom. It's gone. The disgrace of having a son say, you know, it's just not worth being with you anymore. I just want your stuff. Off he went. You know, we've had friends and perhaps family members do that to us. And so we know what this father was feeling, the kind of shame, the kind of offense that he was feeling, but it didn't seem to affect him. He seemed absolutely impervious. He doesn't even seem to notice it. And if he notices it, it doesn't actually register to him as anything he should be offended, be offended by. He's just overlooking all of that, saying, Oh, you're back. I'm so happy that you're back. But this younger son has something he has to deal with. See, we, we think the way, the way this story ends is that everyone lives happily ever after. Well, how is the younger son feeling in this party? Is anyone in the community talking to him at the party? Probably not. Probably sitting at the table with his father. The father's the only one talking to him. Everyone else in the community is sort of maybe like you and I would be doing, kind of dancing around him. Oh, we'll eat his, we'll drink his wine, we'll eat his food. It's a big party. We'll go to the father's party, but everyone's kind of whispering. <laughs> what is he doing? I mean, what's who's gonna make sure the kid doesn't do it again? I mean, all of a sudden, we're, 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 what did the townspeople say? Well, we are the townspeople in Jesus' story. This is told for us. 
How are you feeling about this son who's just come in? Are, are you going to dance with him? Are you, hey, come on. You know how they used to do the dances. Everyone's got their arms around their shoulders. They're kicking their legs one way or the other. It's a big, it's a big festival in those days. Are you out on the dance floor? Are you inviting that prodigal son to dance with you and your friends and your family? Or do you need to make him suffer a bit because of what he's done, because of this disgrace? I'm just going to pause for a minute. I, I want, it's very important that we not read these things over too quickly. In Jesus' story, a lot of us think, oh, I, yeah, I'm the prodigal son. God loves me. Well, okay, then you've got something to overcome. You've got to overcome your shame. And actually, the Father is celebrating over you. Can you celebrate over you? Amen. Or can you only celebrate when everyone else is able to celebrate? Can you celebrate because he is throwing a party for you? He is happy that you're back. Or are you going to wallow in shame? And how long will you wallow in your shame? Because there's the Father. He's in the party with you. He's sitting with you. He's got you seated at the head table with him. You are wearing his robe. You have his ring on your finger. You've got his shoes on your feet. He brought you back to the house. It's your room, just like you left it. Go ahead, shower up. Get ready for the party. Oh, you're taking a shower. You're like, oh, I don't really want to shower. <laughs> What am I going to, who am I going to talk to? I'd, really, I'd rather not. I'd rather just kind of stay here. I just wanted to be his servant. I don't want to take that position again as his son. When the father is there with you at the table, what attitude would give joy to the father? A somber, shameful hanging of your head? Or saying, Dad, should we get up and dance? But I want you to notice how hard it is to get up and dance when you're feeling shame. But that is what your father wants. Because he's thrown a party, and he wants to be joyful that you to be joyful that you're back with him. And if all you're doing is hanging your head in shame, who's the story about? Not you. And your shame. And what people think of me. And what my friends are going to say. And where am I going to get a job next week? And well, all the questions that that prodigal son was asking himself. It's not about their relationship with the father. Like most of us, all that I'm thinking about is me. And from the time the prodigal took the money and hit the road and spent it, he was thinking about himself. He gets back, and who's he still thinking about? But in the story, you see what Jesus is saying. Can you think for a bit about how the Father feels? My son is back. He was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. He is happy. And in each of these stories, the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son, something very strange happens. It's a very strange character in each of these. The shepherd in the lost sheep leaves his 99 and goes after this one, which most of us consider not very smart. It's like leaving $99 on the table and go out and try to find your $1 bill. It, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And when he finds his dollar or his sheep, he carries it back home and he invites his friends and neighbors to come and celebrate with him. <clears throat> Not so sure if I was a friend and neighbor, I would, I guess if he had a good meal or a good party, I might go by, but I'm busy. I, I don't really want to celebrate that you found your sheep. <laughs> I, I've got things to do. I've got a family. I've got, you know, look, I'm. And then if you find your coin, what, what do I want to know? Just tell me where you lost it. I mean, I, I don't want to come celebrate with you over your coin. But this woman finds a coin and, again, invites her friends and neighbors to come celebrate the fact that she found her coin. I think many of us might miss the fact that 
I wouldn't celebrate that. I'd be like, well, just, I mean, take better care of your coins next time. <laughs> I mean, try not to lose them, will you? You wouldn't, you know, try, try. Watch your stuff. Put them in a bag. That's what I do. I put them in a little coin bag. I don't lose my coins. What's all this celebration going on? And then the craziest of all is the son squanders half or a third of your property, comes back, He's throwing not only a, a small party, it's a huge party. This fattened calf is something waiting for a huge celebration. And the father, again, is making this big, big celebration. These are crazy people. These are crazy people. They're crazy. Why? Because they're celebrating things that you and I typically would not celebrate. And Jesus is showing us something about the heart of the father. He's not like us got to get that point. He's not like you. He celebrates things that you and I don't celebrate. But if we want to be like him, and we all want to be like him, we have to learn to celebrate things that he celebrates. And we have to learn how to sit at a banquet for ourselves after we've just squandered a third of the property and enjoy it. And that's going to take some practice. That is not our nature. Because everyone in the room is still shaming you. Except the Father. And the Father wants you to have great joy. Why? Because you're with Him. Because you've actually found the most important thing in all the world. And it's Him. Why is He not afraid you're going to leave again? Why is the Father so confident, like everyone's love, well, I mean, you know, you should make sure he's, you know, he's got to work his way into this. Because the father is so convinced. If my son just got to know me, so he didn't know me when he left, but if he just gets to know me, he is never going to want to leave. He's like a child. The father is actually like a child. When Jesus says, Unless you become like a child. child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Why do we need to become like a child? Because the father's like a child. He's celebrating things that you and I don't celebrate. He's showing how joyful he is. And he wants us to become like a child. See, children, they're, they're very joyful. In fact, when we talk to them, we're like, oh, that's so cool. Oh, wow. We, we use exaggerated expressions. It's like a, a way of celebrating the child. The father's like that. And those of you who are fathers, you're like that too. Amen. And we are all meant to be fathers. Every man in here is meant to be a father. And to celebrate, even if other people are not celebrating. The father has eyes to see something that he is celebrating. <laughs> Here's a question. Why, why did the father not argue with the son when he said, divide the property. I want a third. I want, a, I want, my, I want what's coming to me. If your son came to you and said, Dad, uh, I know you've got some money in the bank. Would you, uh, would you divide it and just go ahead and give me what's mine? At least there'd be a little word of protest. I mean, most of us would be, son, I, I, let's just think about this. Let's, let's get some counsel. Not a word of protest from the father when the son says, give me what's coming to me. I'm on my way. Why? What is this telling us about the father? And what is it telling us about his relationship to you and to me? If he, yes, if he argues with you, if he withholds it from you, in your mind, you're still not convinced you can't get it out there, aren't you? As long as you're serving him, but you somehow believe there's really a better party out there, you're actually not sold out to him. You're not, you're not convinced that he is not only the best way, but the only way. 
I mean, the father is so confident. He's saying, look, go ahead. Try to find a better deal than you're going to get right here. Go ahead. Unless I give you your stuff and let you go with it and try to get your pleasure on the outside, you are never going to be convinced that this is the best place for you to get it. Yeah. And we're not just talking about money here. We all have tremendous gifts that we have all used for our pleasure. Women have used their beauty many, many times to get pleasure. That was a gift given by God. Just like this prodigal son, they've used their beauty to get pleasure for themselves, and it's ended, ended them in pain and misery. We have used our intelligence. Some of us are dashing good looks, I can see. We've got some people who God has bestowed with, with physical features, with wealth, with intelligence, and we've used those gifts, and it's very common in our young life to use those gifts to say, I know how to get the good stuff, and I can get it out there. And unless God gives it to you and says, uh, no strings attached, go ahead, hotshot, what he said to me, go ahead, hotshot, burn it out, get what you can, go get it, and I will be here waiting when you get back. That's the kind of, because you're not, but unless I give this to you so you can prove that you're not going to get a better deal than right here, we're just wasting our time. We're just pretending I'm a good father, but you actually don't know me. The young son left because he didn't actually know his father. He really didn't want to. He had no reason to. Because he believed that the good stuff was out there. In the father's house is where it's at. Yeah. Yeah.